Hello and welcome to The Tech Show. Coming up this week, what have we got, Owen? New helmet from Fox. Mm, and we've got some new power meters that are compatible with Shimano cranks. And we talk about expensive stuff. I can hear people groaning already, but mm. expensive stuff that's worth it. So... Might be. No, definitely. <laughs> Let's crack on. So, our topic today is expensive stuff, but expensive stuff that's actually <laughs> worth it versus the eye-wateringly expensive stuff that we sometimes discuss and gets the keyboard warriors going. Yeah, I know, right? And we should do a little disclaimer here first. We know expensive is subjective uh, to one person. It might be affordable to another, probably very much not. Um, and also worth it is subjective, but we will be discussing that. I feel yeah. like the stuff that we're going to be talking about here might just command the price tag because perhaps it uses more expensive materials, perhaps it takes longer to make and it is worth the price tag but I guess whether it's worth it to you or not is debatable um, but yeah I think one of the best examples that I can come up with and I saw this firsthand when I went to the industry nine workshop was seeing how uh, hubs like the i9 Hydra command a high price tag. They cost about £450 per hub. And when you see that one piece, just that high engagement um, tooth piece in the center has to be uh, cut out and then pre-hardened and then run through this uh, specialist machine in a vat of deionized water with some electricity through wire cutting out and it cuts it out twice. And then, you know, there's a lot of processes just for a, this one a piece. A lot of attention to detail as well. And I yeah. guess that's where the, the value is, is that you're getting a part that, because of all that attention to detail through all the process versus mm. just a bit of glob of grease in a sort <laughs> of generic cartridge bearing, yeah. that isn't maybe that nice. You're getting something that should last for yeah, an eternity, or the next hub standard change mm. that we have. But also, if you think high engagement hubs are worth it, then that's the price tag you have to pay to get that, um, because you can't just pre you know quickly press it out of uh, just any old piece yeah. of steel. Um, and I think there's bearings as well. Is I mean, you mentioned in Greece, and, and yeah. I think a well-maintained hub can be worth its weight in gold, really. Yeah. Um, but when we start talking about bearings, they're a tough thing to make, really. That sounds stupid yeah, yeah, no, to they say. Are. Yeah, I mean, but it's something bearings. that's got to be, in your cartridge bearing, you've got to have these races, yeah. but then because they're kind of like the axle loads and the kind of radial loads, they need to be a, a sphere. It's not like a roller bearing. Mm. Um, it'd be great if we could use roller bearings everywhere, but we, <laughs> but we can't. So we're using ball bearings uh, in a cartridge bearing, and they have to be really yeah. round, because if they weren't, they'd start to wear on different points. And, yeah. and then, yeah, the whole expense of having a fancier hub or fancier cartridge bearing is just going to melt away in a crummy bearing. Well, just for example, I mean, a cheap um, bearing, you know, it doesn't cost that much. It costs pounds, perhaps. Pounds. But if you look at something like a ceramic speed bearing where you can change up uh, the bearings for your wheels, for example, that have super low friction, they're apparently 50% less friction, 50% weight um, claimed. But basically, that one, one of those bearings, just one, Owen, takes 50 to 70 days to make. So we can see where the price tag comes from and it's made out of this sort of hybrid ceramics um, material as well that's like developed for NASA. Yeah. So we understand why this costs hundreds of pounds to make rather than a couple of pounds, but is it worth it? I think for me, I'll just say, <laughs> I'm sure they are amazing and I've seen them and played with those bearings mm. and they are, I'm not a bearing specialist, so I'm They're not someone who can hold one and go, ooh, that's mm. exceptionally spherical. <laughs> More just that I've spun a, a crank round in a very nice uh, yeah. bottom bracket. But I think for me, it's it's one of those things, and I hate the term, but marginal gains. Yes. So whereby uh, if you, you, know, you look at all the tiny details and it all adds up to a big change, which works if you're racing. But I think if you're not racing, maybe just maintaining the kind of quite good cartridge bearings you've got might be really good. Mm. And I guess looping back to those kind of like good enough things where sometimes people's perception of value and, and wonder why that kind of like our products command a higher price, for me is like rain jackets. Oh, so you on, can get, really? yeah, yeah, you can okay, get really on. entry point jackets that will be really waterproof. Mm -hmm. You can get kind of like the windproof jackets, which are kind Ooh. of okay. But getting one of those jackets that's both waterproof and breathable, I think it, it just works. 
throwing money at that. Yeah, and then there's that um, accolade, you know, on the triangle, you can have it durable, and you uh, can have it light, and you can yeah, have it waterproof, bomb you can yeah, have yeah. it cheap as well. Um, I think that big expensive coats that cost around about £200, because that's what you're paying for a proper, say, can Gore-Tex yeah, jacket yeah. Um, for riding, they're super durable, they're super waterproof. They spent a lot of R&D working out um, that material to be breathable and waterproof. The fit is very much different to what you'd get on it, say, a £20 jacket. But yeah, it is. Is it worth it? Is it worth it to you? Um, is the question. If you're doing a half an hour commute to work and you just want it to be splash proof, perhaps that doesn't bother you. But if you're doing six hour rides in the rain, maybe it does bother you. Yeah. Um, but what about helmets? Because I think there's so many good helmets out there at the moment. Um, even uh, something like a Smith Convoy is selling MIPS, which used to be the high end, like yeah. 200 pound helmet um, safety feature, is now uh, sub 100 pounds. We're looking at about £75 for that helmet. Um, so I'm going to say that going for some increased features, um, a lot of R&D into ventilation and fit, and then the safety of the MIPS, for example, it's going to command a higher price tag. Do you think it's worth it? I think it, with, with a helmet, I think it's there's lots of helmets out there that pass the basic um, safety tests, and that's great. Um, MIPS is a really clever system, and for a lot of people it can work. It's not. It's not necessarily a guarantee of a safer helmet. There's a big discussion, like actually at an international sort of like helmet safety level on that one. Oh, um, no, it is funny. It's like a whole black hole that you can fall <laughs> into. However, I think spending a bit more money on something that fits, like it doesn't feel like it's on your head. I think that's worth it. Like if you, you, you're feeling like you're having to wear a helmet and it's clunky on top because you bought the kind of like the lowest one that you could afford versus spending a little bit more. Mm to get one that doesn't feel like you're wearing it. I think that's money well spent because you're gonna well, wear your helmet and that's just essential safety. Yeah. I see where the money goes when I wear an expensive helmet. Would I pay 400 pounds for a carbon full face? Yeah, would you? I, no, not. I'm not gonna. I, but I don't wear <laughs> a full face, not, so I'm not yeah, gonna, exactly. it's fine. That's I'm not gonna not, buy a TT helmet either, that's so That's not good. my department. Um, but would I spend 25 on helmet? There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. We should say that they have to be, if they're sold in a decent store, they have to be to a certain safety standard yeah. legally anyway, but you're just not gonna get a movable visor, you're not going to get multiple sizes, um, and I guess it comes down to what we said at the beginning, isn't it? Is worth it? Is subjective? Is it worth it to you? Um, so should we open this up to the viewers now and ask them, guys, what do you think about these items? They command a big price tag and perhaps they deserve that price tag, but are they worth it? Is there anything else out there that you think is expensive but it definitely is worth it? Maybe a titanium frame, maybe even yeah. titanium cranks, factory suspension. Are these expensive things worth it? Let us know down in the comments below. So Privateer have dropped a new Gen 2 on their range of bikes. Now they haven't been completely specific with um, what bikes they're doing and what the changes are, but we know it would be refreshing their whole range. So they're effectively now giving us full insertion seat posts or seat tubes for your seat posts, uh, steeper seat angles, size specific chain stays. They'll now have some flip chip adjustments in the rear center and a flip chip adjustment so that you can change between 29 and mix wheel, which they've never done before. For, so that's pretty cool. Um, and they've also been mucking around with the suspension. So check those out if you're interested in Privateer because pre-sales will be opening in February. Super interesting, I'll look into that. And now we've got a new helmet from Fox, as promised at the title. So it's the new Drop Frame Pro. Um, so it's got ear protection. For oh. someone like me, it's always, always good. Of the, <laughs> the bigger ear, especially at the Christmas one. It's got MIPS, as we've talked about previously. Boa, so that's the dial adjustment on the back, so that'll be really nice. Three position adjustable visor, I think that's essential. I've only got two on mine. Mm. I think a, uh, an extra click on adjustment would be good. Increased ventilation, three sizes, seven different colors, Whoa. all for under 270 quid. Lovely. Um, now, Rota, who we used to know them for their sort of overlies chain rings and their sort of 
power crank meters. Um, now they've brought out a chain ring with a power meter in that is Ooh. compatible with Shimano. But don't worry, you can remove the uh, wearable teeth part of it. That's a sort of oh, 100 cool. by 4 BCD attachment. Um, but it is new to them now to have um, compatibility with Shimano XT, XTR, and SLS cranks. Uh, it'll have 350 hours riding time, or you can recharge that power meter by USB. Um, it's only 99 grams, available in either 32 up to 36, and you can have that oval or round. Um, and that would be $497, which is probably about right for a power meter anyway. Quiz time. This is quite exciting. <laughs> it is, Rotor is it? created Q rings. Yeah, it is. Speaking of Rotor, yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, I mean, their first product wasn't. It wasn't the oval these, chain. No, that, it wasn't. Was it not? No. Oh, okay. So they made a special crank. So back in the day oh, when you had facts. square taper, yeah, useless fact. Back in the day when you had square taper cranks, they would wear. Yes. And essentially, you'd kind of like Fun pedal along, and you and you'd kind of like have your pedals level, and one side would sort of like slip down. Essentially, Rotor cleverly made a crank that had a leverage linker, a leverage uh, linkage inside, that that made your crank sort of do that, oh. but on purpose rather than it, it falling about, and that was to get rid of the dead spot. Then they realised that they could just do it with an oval. Chain. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, so that's what I I knew them as as basically the oval chain ring people yeah. trying to remove that dead spot. But Owen. They weren't the first to be mucking around with non-round chain rings, really? were they? We were seeing these as early as 83 to 93 oh. from Shimano. But, Owen, do you know what that technology was called yeah. from Shimano? You do. I do. Of course yeah. you do. But do you? Let us know down in the comments below. Okay, Owen, I've got some bike caves for Ooh, you. We're going to snoop. I love so a bike cave. My first one here is from Andrew in Perth in Western Australia. Hi, Andrew. Good day. Um, who's basically been inspired by Blake's epic shed builds and has built himself a little cave. So check this out. He's got all his bikes on the wall, which, as we know, we've come to love that here this is very at good. Tech because it makes such a good uh, space good saver. Good security. No uh, drop and bears then, accessing it either. So exactly. And then talking of space saving, check out this desk. Watch what it does. It drops down. Would you believe it? That's genius. I love it. That's very I absolutely clever. I love well that. <laughs> and then bonus bike cave here for you uh, from Jeremy in Woodstock, Canada, um, who said basically he crashed his bike um, not so Less long ago. Optimal. No, suboptimal, but it did give him some time to think about his garage, and so he's cleared it out and put some boarding on the walls and some um, basically popped all, the tools all his tools up. and nice. tied it up. And so now he's got a also uh, very good, very place he calls it lovely tidy uh, cupboard there. I wish I'd got one of those. Is your workshop a peaceful place to go and hide from? <laughs> yeah, no, it is. I feel like it's the opposite. No, it is. It's a very peaceful place. That's good. <laughs> yeah, it's very good. Okay, Owen, so last week we were talking about important tech releases from yes. 2023. And so you lovely people obviously had a lot to say, and there was a lot um, of opinion on Pinion. Um, oh, and Gearbox is loving it, thinking, I think basically that was our viewers' favorite invention from last year, even though it didn't come out last year, but it's, you know, it's getting popularized. So um, Nigel says, has to be the Pinion Motor Gearbox, because if nothing else, it proved it could be done and put into production. I think he's talking more about the sort of all shift and the e-bike stuff that yeah. came out last year. Um, we've also got Rydent, who said, uh, check out the Zero G3. Uh, that was an important release in 2023. Uh, they updated their high pivot um, belt driven downhill bike. So check that out. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. I do think we forget about Zero a lot because they've just been around for so long. Yeah, they have. And been like making really innovative stuff for quite mm. a while. We kind of always forget because it's like, oh, it's Zero. They just do innovation. Of course. <laughs> Obviously, their innovation has been fantastic, but. Yeah, Blake's wireless brakes still get lots of conversation they because it do. is incredible. Blake's, yeah, the yeah. inventor. Extraordinaire <laughs> with that. Yeah, Bill Duras saying that uh, the wireless brakes were uh, the most interesting. Um, Alex Ford saying, considering how many people are sweating the lack of mech hangers for uh, Ragley and Noop Proof, etc., uh, the UDH should be pushed by all manufacturers. Um, yeah, I, I mean, didn't know there was a stocking issue on derailers, but that is the problem when you have a derailer hanger that is specific to your bike. So UDH is very important. 
um, yeah, if invention, your bike fits it, yeah. I think. Um, yeah, sort of <laughs> unrelated. Zob4 has said the classified hub is the most overrated thing to come out this year. <laughs> it's a worse version of a technology that's already become obsolete. Um, I mean, okay, if Zob4 you've ridden there. it, then fair enough. Yeah. I rode it a little bit and I was actually quite impressed. Okay, mm -hmm. just trying to car park. He's, he's, um, but yeah. he's completely alone in his, actually, because uh, really? there's a lot oh, of right. people who are quite into the two-speed hub. Um, so Zachary Moore says, 14-speed would be sick on an enduro seven-speed derailleur. Uh, would be sick to actually be able to use it to go uphill. Yeah. And there was a whole heap of people in the comments saying, Owen's builds needs to be a thing. And we want to see a two-speed rear hub downhill bike. Okay, it might be an you. enduro bike because I can't do downhill. I know. Yeah, mum said I'm not allowed to, so <laughs> enduro only. 14 um, speed, first 14 speed yeah, uh, enduro bike coming, yeah. coming this way. We can make that happen. Maybe uh, it's Coots Creates though. Maybe we'll do a rebrand. Oh, that sounds so, good, yeah. doesn't it? Because Blake's got, Coots yeah, Coots. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Blake builds, Blake builds Coots, Coots Creates, but yeah. Anna annotates. Oh, oh gosh. do you? I can just comment on everyone oh, else's well, no, that's that'd perfect, be great. Yeah. Um, speaking of what's coming up on Saturday, I will be explaining chain stretch to you, like fully explaining how it happens with visuals and everything. Okay, um, nice. How you can avoid it and how you can check it. And then on um, Sunday, mm. we've got the hottest enduro bikes. So hot right now. Yeah, released in 2023. Exactly. So, that's very good. so if you're in the market for a new one this year, then do check that out. Uh, but for now, that's all we've got time for. So thanks for stopping by. And do join in the debate down in the comments below about whether you think there is some expensive stuff out there that's actually worth it. Yeah.